Now, to do a market basket analysis, you first want to open up your data to see what format the data is in. So if I head over to Excel, I can see that there's really two ways that the transactional data might be stored. Uh, the first way is where each row of the data set represents a transaction and the number of columns for that row represents the number of items in that transaction. And the other way would be where each row represents a particular item that was purchased, where we have one column that tells us a shopper ID or a shopping cart ID, and another column that lets us know, well, what item was purchased. And so we'll see a lot of duplicate shopping cart IDs that let us link together the items that are in a particular shopping cart. And just depending on the format of the data, that just dictates how you read the data into R itself. So what we'll use is a command that is in the A rules package, short for association rules, called read.transactions. So read.transactions will help us get the data in to R itself. And if we read groceries.csv, that was where each row represented a particular shopping cart. We're gonna say that that has a basket format. And so when we read that in, it has no problem and we can go and inspect what the first few carts are. So cart number one had citrus fruit, margarine, ready soups, and semi-finished bread. Cart number two, coffee, tropical fruits, and yogurt. Now, if your data is stored the other way, where essentially each row corresponds to an item being purchased, you have a column for basket ID, another column for the item that's being purchased, you'll still use read.transactions. It'll just be format equals single. And you'll have to say, well, what columns contain the ID and the item itself? But if you read that, you can inspect it just the same, and it's treated the same way internally. So basket ID this had the games Dungeons and Dragons Online and Pet Horses 2. Didn't know there was a sequel. Uh, cart number two in this, this uh, cart ID right here, only had the Elder Scrolls Skyrim actually purchased. So one thing that both these methods have in common once the data has been read in is in order to look at the transactions at all, you have to use the inspect command. So unfortunately, you can't just say something like, all right, show me the first four transactions with say head, like where you'd be able to see the first four elements of a vector or a data frame. It just lets you know that, hey, head G comma four, there's four transactions in there and 169 possible items that might appear in those. To actually see what those transactions consisted of, it's gonna be inside the inspect command. So whenever we're dealing with the A rules library, the vast majority of the time, if we actually wanna see something about the transactions themselves, if we wanna see something about the rules that we're discovering, we're gonna to have to put something inside of an inspect command. All right, so once we've read in those transactions, well, what can we do with them? We can do a little bit of descriptive analytics and figure out, well, what are the most commonly purchased items? So A rules has a bunch of very useful commands built in, like item frequency plot. If I run item frequency plot on the set of transactions that I've read in and say top n equals 20, it's gonna show me what the 20 most frequently purchased items are in the database. Uh, database. So here, uh, type equals absolute lets me know the total number of items. If I were to change this to relative, then I would get the percentages of carts with each of those, these items as well. So I can quickly scan and see, okay, well, what are the most frequently appearing items? If I want the numbers themselves, I can use the item frequency command. So running item frequency on the transactional data itself is going to print out a list of every item that appears in the transactional data, along with the percentage of the carts that contain those items. So hamburger meat appeared in 3.3% of the shopping carts in this data set. So the result of running item frequency is just a vector, so you can put square brackets after it and look to see, well, what's the 121st item alphabetically? turns out to be rice. If you want a particular item and you know its name, inside the square brackets, you can just refer to the name of that item in quotes. So what fraction of carts had soups in it? Looks like about 0.68%. 
If you want to know the number of carts, well, length of G would tell you the number of transactions. We have just under 90 or just under 10,000 carts here. And if you don't really know what the labels are for each of the unique items in the transactional data, uh, I think the grep command is phenomenally useful here. Now, for those of you that know Unix, have done a Linux operating system before, you might have used grep to do some sort of pattern matching. So go through a text file and report back all lines that have, say, a particular fragment, a particular sentence fragment, like I love soup. You can go find all the lines that contained that sentence. So grep works very similarly in R. The first argument is essentially the pattern that you're going to be looking for. So let's say I wanted to find all items that had milk somewhere in the name. Well, I'm going to grep for milk. It is case sensitive, so the lowercase m-i-l-k will be the only ones that's being returned. The second argument of grep is simply a vector of text where it's going to go through element by element and look to see, well, do I see milk there or not? So if I actually just run the grep command by itself, it tells me which item numbers contain the words milk. Not very useful, it's just the 16th, the 35th items, etc. in that sorted list of items. And so if I just put that inside square brackets after item frequency on my transactions, that'll let me know actually what both the frequencies were of all those items and the items themselves. So four types of milk, buttermilk, condensed milk, UHT milk, and whole milk as well. So you can get details about how often different items appear in carts with that item frequency command. I think very powerful when combined with the square brackets and grep. And those are useful for knowing what the prior probabilities of finding items are. So before knowing what the composition of the cart is, what's the probability of finding whole milk in a cart in this data? Well, just over 25%. And the market basket analysis is going to be here to let us know how that probability changes once we know what other items are in the cart. So how do we find these association rules? How can we find this or perform this market basket analysis? Well, the command that we're going to use is called a priori. It's actually the name of the algorithm that's been invented, one of the few that are able to quickly scour the transactional database and figure out what rules are going to be the most interesting to us. So we'll run the a priori command. The first argument is going to be the name of our transactional data set. So here I read into G, read.transactions, this New Zealand grocery data. So tell me where that transactional data is, and then tell me what kind of rules you find interesting. So one thing we're going to want to tell a priori is what is the minimum support of the rules that we're interested in? Now, remember, the support lets us know what fraction of carts in the data set actually have uh, items that satisfy this rule. It's a measure of how prevalent this rule applies to transactions in general. If it's too rare, we don't care. So we're going to put in a minimum support of rules that we find interesting. So maybe we want to make sure that the rules that we discover apply to at least 0.1% of carts that we're dealing with. So the support would be 0.001. Another way of specifying it would be to say, OK, I want to make sure that I'm finding rules that apply to at least, say, 100 of the cards in the data, in which case you could say that the minimum support would be 100 divided by length of your transactions that you read in. That would be a nice quick way of specifying you want to make sure that the rules apply to a certain number of cards or more. And then you want to specify, well, what's the minimum confidence you want to have with these rules that you're discovering? It's going to be a waste of time if you come up with rules saying, OK, if someone has apples and bananas, well, I'm 20% confident that they're going to have spaghetti sauce. Typically, we have some minimum threshold for confidence that's going to be useful to us for suggesting new items, for redesigning store layout, figuring out where items should go. And so we'll want to specify what that minimum level of confidence is. And then we want to specify just how complex we want the rules to be. This is known as the length of the rule. And the length of a rule just refers to the total number of items that the uh, rule encompasses. 
So if apples, then bananas would be length two, because there's two items in there. If apples, bananas, and cauliflower, then pears, that would be a rule of length four, because it references four items. Now, typically you don't want your rules to be too long because that just becomes very difficult to really interpret and difficult to use. So a priori gives us the option of specifying a max length. Now, typically I like using the following parameters, a support of around 0.1% so that it's prevalent enough that it should find some sort of utility within the company, a confidence of maybe 80% or more, a minimum length of two, which is a no-brainer if apples then bananas. We don't want anything simpler than that. That wouldn't be very useful. That just lets us know what fraction of carts have the items. And maybe a maximum length of four or five. If A, B, and C, then D, that's a length four rule. If A, B, C, D, then E, that's length five. You're starting to push the boundary of, well, how useful and easy to understand is this rule going to be? So, once you set that up, once you've set up the a priori command to your liking, you can run it and you can run the inspect command to see the results. So number one, how do you set up, you know, putting in the minimum support, the minimum confidence, the lengths? You actually pass that inside of a list object that you give to the parameter argument of a priori. This control equals list verbose equals false. This is optional. If you leave it out, it's just going to let you know everything that's going on behind the scenes as a priori is running. So how the algorithm is working, some control of it, kind of some progress as it goes along the way, and then a not so useful warning message that just lets you know that the uh, mining stopped once you got up to a length of four but that's how we designed it, so we don't really need to see that warning. Having that verbose equals false is very useful, just cleans up the display. All right, so how do we actually look at the rules? Well, unlike a vector or a data frame, if we just print out the contents of the screen, it just lets us know that, hey, you found 258 rules, good job. The inspect command is what we'll have to use to actually see what the rules uh, contain. So if I say inspect, and then maybe the first five rules, put in brackets, the integer sequence one through five, here's what we end up seeing. So what can we say about the interpretation of these rules here? We see a column for the left-hand side of the rule. That's the if part of a rule. So if a cart has liquor and red blush wine, the and represents the items, different items separated by commas, then they might have bottled beer in their card as well, the right-hand side of the rule to the right-hand side of the arrow. And then we're given information. We're given the support of the rule, the confidence of the rule, the coverage, the lift, and the count. Lots of information. So the count is easy to understand. That's just how many uh, carts in the transactional data contained all three of these items. So how many carts did this rule apply to? 19. So 19 carts had liquor, red blush wine, and then also bottled beer in them. Converting that into the fraction of carts to which the rule applied, that's the support. That works out to be just about 0.2%. So how confident are we in the rule? Well, we're 90.5% confident. That means that if we go and look at our set of transactions, of all the carts that had liquor and red blush wine in them, 90.5% of them had bottled beer. So given that the items on the left-hand side of the rule were in the cart, we're 90.5% confident that the item on the right-hand side of the cart is also going to be in there. 90.5% probability that bottled beer will be there. The coverage of the rule is just the fraction of the carts that have all of the items on the left-hand side of the rule. So this lets us know a bit about how prevalent or how useful this rule might be. So about 0.2% of carts have both liquor and red blush wine. So that's basically how often we'd be able to, to use this, this rule here. That's the fraction of carts uh, that kind of triggers any sort of action based on this rule. And then finally, the lift is really gonna be the number that we'll spend most of the time, I think, focusing in on, because that's letting us know how much the probability changed 
of finding the item on the right hand side of the rule once we knew something about the cart composition, what was in the left hand side of the rule. So the lift is telling us the factor by which that probability has increased once we know the cart composition. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I ask for the item frequency of bottled beer, what I find is that bottled beer appears in about 8% of carts. So without any knowledge of what else is inside the cart, the prior probability of finding bottled beer is right at about 8%. Now this rule has a lift of 11.2, so it's letting me know that if liquor and red blush wine are in the cart, the probability of finding bottled beer there is going to increase by a factor of 11.2. So if I were to take this times 11.2, I get a probability of 90.2%, and wouldn't you know, that works out to be, with a little bit of rounding issues, the confidence of the rule. So the item frequency lets you know the prior probability of finding that item in the cart. The confidence lets you know the posterior probability of finding that item in the cart, given that the items that appear on the left-hand side of the rule are known to be in that cart. The lift is the factor by which the prior probability increases to get to the posterior probability. The support and the coverage both let you know how useful, how prevalent uh, that rule is, what fraction of carts to which that rule is going to apply. Now there's a bunch of things that you can do with these rules to find the ones that are most useful to you. You can sort the rules by lift, by confidence, by support, depending on what you find the most interesting. So here would be the four rules that have the highest lift, where the probability of finding that item on the right-hand side changes the most once you know something about the cart composition. If you want to know the items that have the highest posterior probabilities, you can sort by confidence. And in fact, it looks like there's a few rules that have a confidence of 100%. So every time, every single cart that had rice and sugar also contained whole milk, Turns out that's not too many cards. There's only 12 cards in the data set to which this applies, but still 100% confident. 12 out of 12 had rice or whole milk when they had rice and sugar in them. And you could also support by the rules that have the largest support that are applicable to the largest fraction of cards out there. So depending on what you really want out of those rules, you can sort them by whatever measure you like the most and act accordingly. Now, there's a bunch of other commands where you can go and find rules that just have a particular item on the right-hand side, or all items that have some combination on the left-hand side. You can look up the code for how to work with those rules up on Canvas. There's a great cheat sheet that lets you know how to extract out just the set of rules that you find most interesting. If it's support numbers, confidence numbers, or rules that have particular items in there. Now, another cool thing that you can do with a set of rules that you've discovered is to visualize them to see if there's any sort of relationship between those rules. So are there clusters of rules that have sugar on the left-hand side that all imply the existence of another item on the right-hand side? What hidden associations might we miss if we just look at the list of rules that are being output? Now, to do this, you want to restrict yourself to just a small set of rules. It's very difficult to see how, say, 100 different rules are related to one another. So in this case, what I'm going to do is to refit my a priori algorithm on the transactional data using a confidence of 70% and a length of exactly 3. So if A and B are in the cart, then item C. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select just a few of those rules just for illustration. So how many rules do I have? Well, if I look at the length of simple rules, that'll let me know that, okay, I'm gonna to try to make this visualization for 16 of these rules. So when I run the plot command, that'll bring up a cool little plot. I can make the window be a, bit, a little bit bigger. And that'll let me know, well, okay, do I see any sort of relationship between the rules themselves? And I do. It looks like a whole bunch of rules are all implying the existence of, mousing over, other vegetables in the cart. So how do we read this sort of output? Well, we see some sets of arrows going on. We see some arrows going in 
to a circle, and then an arrow coming out of the circle as well. So anything that's highlighted in purple here represent items to the left-hand side of the rule. So here's a rule that's basically if shopping bags and herbs are in a cart, then we're also going to find potentially other vegetables. It turns out that has a confidence of about 82.6%. And so we can see actually that there's a whole set of rules out here that imply the existence of other vegetables in a cart. And without doing this visualization, it might've been a difficult to kind of discover that, hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, suggesting that this shopper is gonna have other vegetables in there. And we might have little islands of rules that just stand all by themselves. So rule one here is when we've discovered about the liquor, the red blush wine implying bottled beer must be party time or just, you know, a lonely Friday night with your cats. Here's one where you have coffee and miscellaneous beverages implying the existence of soda. And here's kind of an intriguing uh, item right here. Rice actually is part of this other vegetable cluster, and it's also part of implying the existence of whole milk. So depending on how you visualize it, you can understand kind of the structure of how these items are related together uh, even more effectively.